National Insurance Group and produced by Crane and Racing Hotline. My name is Katie Parrish, Editorial Director for Heartland Construction Division, publisher of Crane and Rigging Hotline, and your moderator for today's web conference. Risk management affects all areas of your business and requires planning ahead to ensure it is covered from every angle. With this series, HIG has developed a range of topics to help you prepare for risks, estimate their impact, and define responses to these issues. Additionally, this webinar series will help you establish a plan and a risk strategy that includes avoiding, controlling, and mitigating, accepting, and transferring risk. Today's conference will look at building an effective safety culture, and our presenter and special guests will look at a range of topics to bring your workers home safely, as well as provide two success stories from organizations that have put an effective program in place. Today's presenter, Kevin Cunningham, has 30 years of experience in the heavy industrial insurance and risk management industry. He is currently the CEO of Hig Construction, a division of Houston International Insurance Group, where he is responsible for all business development and overall risk management services for crane, pile driving, foundation, and related heavy civil construction segments. Additionally, Troy Pierce, Vice President of HSE for TNT Crane and Rigging, and Vaughn Jedry, Vice President of HSE for JV Driver Projects, will share their safety culture success stories. Our sponsor, HIG, is an international insurance carrier. This webinar is being recorded, and you can access it at our YouTube channel or at Crane and Rigging Hotline's website. Now I'd like to welcome Kevin Cunningham, who will kick off the conference. Thank you, Katie. Hello, and thank you all for participating. Thank you to our special guests as well. Uh, so let's walk through today's presentation outline on the next slide. Uh, first, we'll discuss a few cultural framework elements. And then we'll touch on assessing your current safety activity. Next, we'll cover the value of taking a responsible care approach as compared to the traditional compliance mandate approach. Then we'll focus a little bit on taking a holistic approach to achieving accountability within your workforce. And we've also included a safety culture reference report from the McGraw-Hill Construction's most recent safety management report for the construction industry, attesting to the value of building safety cultures in your construction companies. Um, and then we'll get to the heart of the matter with two expert perspectives in building effective safety cultures from Vaughn Jedry and at, from the JV Driver Organization in Alberta will provide first-hand experience of the theme of vigilance and team engagement to build your safety culture. And another expert perspective and case study from Troy Pierce from TNT Crane and Rigging, who will share his experience and how the incident in injury-free culture impacted a major oil refinery project and achieved extraordinary results as an outcome. I want to thank you two special guests. We are truly honored to have these two experts participate in our presentation today. And their real life in the trenches experience will prove that building an effective safety culture is definitely achievable with profound benefits to your organizations. And then we'll close with some final thoughts on this very important topic. And we look forward to your feedback and we'll answer any questions. Okay, let's move on to the first slide. First of all, why is it important to build an effective safety culture? First and foremost, for the welfare, welfare of your people, to ensure your safety culture delivers functional, a functional working environment that protects your people so that they go home the same way they came to work every day, all the time. Secondarily, to establish a responsible care approach with your people to drive accountability 
through empowerment to achieve a sustainable culture that consistently recognizes and corrects or avoids recurring hazards. And lastly, to enhance your subcontractor qualifications status to assist your business growth objectives as many general contractors are using this important element in their subcontractor selection process for, for business projects all over the world. The next framework element is a suggestion to assess your current activity. And this element is so important in building effective safety cultures that we will discuss it separately in your next slide. So we'll just move on to how you would define your culture and what it could become. In my experience over the years in crane and heavy construction industry affairs, the term culture too often has been perceived to have an abstract meaning to most heavy iron business leaders, many of whom have struggled with making the culture concept actually function in their organizations. And maybe this is because too often it is perceived to be a buzzword and not a reality. However, what I've learned and what you will hear from our two expert panelists a little later today is that the context of proper safety culture is really very straightforward. Culture creation, culture evolution, and culture management are what ultimately define leadership. And leadership drives organizational quality control practices in all organizations. Therefore, culture and quality management are two sides of the same coin. So we would define an effective safety culture as a pattern of shared learning, open communication, and workforce empowerment to solve problems of external forces with internal integration of quality controls. Now let's move on and discuss resetting your risk tolerance level as a critical element in your safety culture. This element is also very straightforward as it simply means creating a work environment that helps your people avoid complacency in their daily workplace. The point being is that we all recognize heavy iron project hazard levels are quite significant. Yet your people encounter these hazards every day, all the time, and this can cause complacency to set in. This is especially true when projects have tight performance deadlines. So you see, it is human nature that your people in the field may let their guards down occasionally when they face similar hazards regularly all the time. So when we recognize this, and leadership communicates the tone from the top for all its people to reset their risk tolerance level every day, you will establish an environment to recognize, correct, or avoid hazards. And then lastly, Clearly, the leadership element is key in building and maintaining a safety culture for obvious reasons. Your people are accustomed to following your lead, so your voice in establishing an effective safety culture will resonate deeply with your people. Now let's discuss assessing your current activity to build an effective safety culture. As you can imagine, company leadership commitment is absolutely essential for people to see that you are willing to think differently about enhancing your company activity and thereby culture. And a good starting point in the assessment process is to determine how much individual and personal elements really exist in your company's current safety activity. Or is your current activity primarily based on requirements to comply with regulatory rules. The point being, by changing the primary focus of safety from regulatory requirement to comply, to achieving an attitude of, I personally want to work safely by your workforce, your culture will have improved significantly coming right out of the gates. And by gaining feedback through individual safety appraisals from your people, you establish a sound baseline for ongoing cultural improvement. So the next important element to assess your current activity is to honestly measure your employee attitudes and beliefs of what they perceive 
about your current safety procedures and cultures. Now, this step will likely take some time to get your people to open up and express their true feelings. So you may want to consider enlisting some employee volunteers that show leadership, show a leadership interest to break the ice with their peers as opposed to top-down management obtaining feedback right out of the gates in these culture building initiatives. And lastly, in the assessment of your current activity element, it is recommended to establish an ongoing annual assessment step to measure improvement year over year as your people buy into your new safety culture and process. All right. Let's move on to section three and discuss the value of establishing a responsible care approach. This section of today's presentation is most critical in building an effective safety culture. And I feel personally this is where the proverbial rubber meets the road. In my personal experience underwriting your industry over the past 30 years, crane and heavy construction business leaders understand and respect regulatory safety obligations. However, I've experienced many in our industry have all too often gotten bogged down with regulatory compliance-based safety. And today, almost everywhere we turn, we see various experts promoting OSHA 10 or OSHA 30 or even OSHA 500. And this, in my opinion, detracts from building an effective safety culture. It is not to take away from the requirements set forth by regulators, it simply is a detraction because it's not personal, which you'll hear more about from our experts. So you see, we need to recognize the reason that our people come to work is a very personal thing, and that is to provide for their families. So if we were to take a very personal approach to your company culture by focusing on our people's personal issues, instead of enforcing malicious compliance to regulatory obligations, we will get to the people's, our people's hearts and minds. Vaughn Jedry, I have learned, is an expert in this area and will expand on this uh, ideology in, in her discussion. So by genuinely getting to people's hearts and minds, your company can establish a culture that your people will see value, that, that values them as individuals and is focused more on protecting them and their families rather than complying to regulations as the driving force for your safety culture. So by leadership applying new thinking to address old recurring problems, your people will recognize visible, proactive, and extraordinary vision and commitment to safety at all levels in their company. And the outcome is that we achieve more buy-in from the ranks. And by gaining new, these new relationships with your people, you will be establishing a foundation for accomplishment. Troy Pierce will have some expert commentary on that, that matter. And lastly, by leaders taking this approach, you will, in essence, have created space for your people to adapt to the hazards they face every day, which is one of the most positive outcomes of building an effective safety culture in your organization. So now let's move on to section four, taking a holistic approach to accountability. The first point and the second point are interrelated. Obviously very basic, but extremely important in building an effective safety culture. So we've all heard that safety is everyone's personal responsibility, and this must go beyond buzzwords to become a reality in day-to-day -day operations to build an effective safety culture. As we can all imagine, it is virtually impossible for company safety directors to recognize, communicate, correct, or avoid hazards on all job sites every day, all the time. So safety directors should only lead and facilitate, but cannot be accountable for hazard recognition and corrective action, even though they may participate rational thinking would agree that they should be part of the process, not the process. And a functional safety culture would naturally embed certain disciplines for proper safety roles for safety directors and safety responsibilities in your workforce. 
With that said, a culture of discipline is not always just about action. It is about getting disciplined people to engage in disciplined thought, who then take disciplined action to avoid or correct job site hazards as part of their normal, everyday duties. And when organizations establish functional safety or risk management committees that your people can participate in and share examples of their daily ongoing hazard recognition stories, your culture will become contagious. So it is strongly urged that you establish some type of open communication form in your company and promote honest feedback. The outcome will be a culture of accountability as your people develop trust in your new process. All right, now let's move to Section 5 and briefly touch on what McGraw-Hill Construction has to say about safety culture. You will see this page 8 is an excerpt from the recent Safety Management and Construction Industry Report. This is an intensely detailed 52-page study of over 250 participating contractors, 49% of whom were general contractors, 37% were specialty subcontractors, 6% were design build, and 6% were construction management and the remaining 2% were engineering firms. So we get a solid cross-section for industry reference. You'll note the highlighted section towards the bottom that reflects the industry support of promoting safety culture and involving job site workers in daily safety process. The report is, uh, is a free report. It, it can be obtained online. And this is just a brief testament to validate our topic today. Now let's hear from our two experts in the trenches, Juan Jedry and Troy Pierce. Juan, how about if you start and Troy will provide his perspective after yours? Change the game. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Kevin, for the invitation. And it's my honor to be here representing JV Driver. Um, Thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your day to attend. It's such an important topic, and I'm proud to, to tell you a little bit about what we're doing here in Alberta um, at our operations across Canada and in the U.S. Um, when we talk about making safety personal, it's, you know, and, and my notes are that we're trying to move beyond just the words, and, and like Kevin was mentioning, it's the buzzword, and really moving beyond that and understanding you know why? What's really important to the people that are that are doing the work that are on the sharp end of our industry and and um, and moving cranes and lifting you know hoisting loads and um, working in excavations? What's driving their behavior? And it is so personal. And I don't think there's anything more personal than safety when it comes to their, an individual's reasons uh, for protecting the things that he that he or she loves. One of the things that we really tried to do um, in 2015 is, and 2014 and, and coming into 2015, is find a strong, powerful message that connects with the people that are, that are in the field. And these are strong, powerful people that are very, very proud of what they do. Um, they love their families. They're hard workers. They, we don't always send them uh, into the field with, with uh, the whole story, the whole plan. Um, but they work hard every day, and every day they go to work wanting to do a good job and stay safe and get home to the things that they and the, the people that they love. So what we did was we took, you know, essentially what we're, we're what we're trying to do is be vigilant always in everything that we do, and try to build that into the language of our workforce. And I, the goal was for the, uh, a strong image to be tied to a very strong message about doing the right thing for the right reason. And that reason is going to be personal to each and every one of you. But always be vigilant in your pursuit of safety. There are so many um, product brands out there. Um, you know, the Harley Davidson shirts, the, you know, the UFC, the Affliction uh, gear. That's what they have on them. Those are things that mean uh, a lot to them. They like the look, so I, you know, we thought let's give them something to be proud of and something that reflects the industry that they do and their core values. And the word that we came up with was vigilance, because at the end of the day, that's what we're looking for. I think from all of all construction workers, all all field workers, 
is to be vigilant in how you execute your daily duties. Uh, plan, talk, plan some more, talk some more, and really understand the risk that's in front of you and be relentless in your pursuit of that. We were, like I mentioned in the slide, we really tried to build on the immense pride that's in the industry. I, I don't think I can name a tradesperson that I've dealt with in the field that at, at their core, they weren't very proud. They sometimes forget that it's a, a strong industry and not everybody can do it. Um, a lot of people think they can do it, but they can't because it's hard, it's tough, it needs tough people um, to put in the kind of days and, and the kind of effort that we need to, to put forth a, a good product and stay safe. So a vi vigilance is a strong word that represents strong, proud people, and that's how we see the construction workforce. The, the big thing that we need is our leaders to be engaged and active in supporting this uh, going forward. If they aren't engaged, their crew won't be engaged. And we really need to bring our field leaders in, recognize their talent, their contributions. They've done so much in terms of building the, the safety system, the program, and the culture. And they need to establish their legacy going forward. They, we need to embrace the, all the skills and all the talent and all the learnings and all the, the fumbles along the way and take that to our crews that are going to be, um, they're going to be leaders tomorrow. So it's really about taking our talent today, embracing their contribution, and show them the importance of their role in helping us prepare the next, um, the next generation of construction uh, people. So really in getting the field leaders engaged and understanding it, promoting it and supporting it is so important because if they don't believe it, the crew won't believe it. Um, and when it comes to the crew, when they tell you something, if you ask them what they think, listen and, and do something about it because we see our uh, historic intervention and, and observation programs going in the, in the toilet because we ask them to tell us and then we don't do anything about it. So we've really focused on real-time reporting. We can get back our, our data from the day before, and then we get our craft involved. OK, team, you've reported on the system. Now what are we going to do about it? And it's really the solutions need to come from the craft. They're there in the trenches every day, and they're the best ones uh, to tell us uh, how we can fix things, how we can make things better going forward, and then having the leaders support that. And so actively engaging the crew, uh, giving them the why behind everything we do. And it's not about just because the book says so. It's because this is helping us protect the things that are the most valuable to us. And that's our crew. That's our reputation. That's our ability to provide safety and security for every family member that counts on us to do the right things. So it's giving them the why. And it's, it's sending them home every day. And, uh, and having them just feeling that pride and being involved and being part of a great industry. And that's really what the Vigilance Program is about. And it's so much about culture. And I just, Kevin, just to finish off, I'm probably taking way too much time, but uh, I guess the thing is, is that a culture, you know, a culture is what we make it. A culture grows organically based on the environment. And we have the ability to, to involve the crew and, you know, change aspects of our culture that makes it okay for a big, tough iron worker to say, well, I don't think this is right. Um, but it's about always giving them a voice and always, always listening. And, you know, we're not going to be able to act on every single thing, right? But, you know, if, if they're not telling us every single thing, we're going to miss some real nuggets and some real opportunity. And how we respond to that feedback is so critical. You've got to keep the crew talking and, and show them that you know, their voice matters. They have one. And let's build, this, you know, build a better industry and send you all home safe. So um, that's really all I have, Kevin. I, I just, it's such a great program, and it's such a great opportunity. And I'm so proud to have been invited to participate. Well, thank you, Vaughn. Uh, your passion is very clear, and, and for those participants on there that don't know about the JV Driver Organization and what Vaughn and her people have, have achieved, it, it's, uh, it, it is truly a success story. They, uh, they, they are a heavy industrial constructor in, in the most hazardous projects all over Canada, uh, across the United States, 
3,000 uh, construction workforce. Uh, I was fortunate to meet Vaughn and a handful of her people, iron workers, millwrights, uh, crane operators. Um, it, it was it, They had a cross-section. And to see firsthand that the culture that J.B. Driver and, and Vaughn has established there uh, from the blue-collar workforce and to see the buy-in uh, was, was just a phenomenal event for me personally and after so many years doing this. And uh, we really appreciate your, your input and perspective, Vaughn, and uh, we hope to stay in touch with you and wish you all the best going forward. All right, Troy, you were Thank up. You. Uh, give us your perspective from the trenches. I hope Troy is... Larry, are you there, Troy? Uh-oh. All right, well, I can set a link. Um, I don't know much about this project other than uh, the outcome. So um, we're going to we'll just keep moving this along, and if Troy can jump back in, we'll uh, love to hear from him. Uh, but Shell Oil uh, has put forth some, uh, some really critical um, safety program, safety culture initiatives. Uh, Vaughn actually introduced me and us and, and part of the crane industry to it. Uh, they had started this Hearts and Minds program, which is a, a very genuine uh, personal approach. Um, Kevin? Troy, Troy, are you there? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. You're, you're up. Okay. Sorry about that, mate. Uh, I think I was muted on the computer system. Somebody okay. just unmuted me so you can hear me. All right. I was trying to wing it and try to talk about your uh, success story, but um, go ahead. Oh, I'm Give coming us to your rescue. All yeah, right. great. Sorry uh, about Kevin, that. <laughs> uh, that's quite all right. I, I, I'm uh, well-versed in making myself look bad. I don't need any help. So, uh, Kevin, thanks for the invitation to talk about a subject that is um, – uh, as important to me as anything else um, close in my life. Uh, you know, TNT, uh, just maybe just a precursor statement, I've, I've only been with TNT for a few months, but I've been involved in this work called Incident and Injury Free uh, for the last 15 years, uh, and I've seen it from uh, several vantage points. Uh, I've been a contractor to a client that was engaged with the consultant, JMJ Associates, I've been the client uh, signing the contract, engaged directly with JMJ Associates, and I've worked for JMJ Associates. So I spent about four years delivering this work uh, and leading part of the company. So I'm, I'm fairly well versed in it. And the example that we have on the screen is referring to a very specific project. Uh, unfortunately, it's not the one I'm going to talk about. Uh, this is one of the more, more recent projects and a success story that is available on their website. Um, speaking about uh, another shell project, but I want to talk about a shell project uh, that was executed in the Middle East uh, in some pretty challenging circumstances and what was achieved there and, and the type of things that needed to take place to make that happen. And all of this example uh, would be the roadmap that TNT Crane and Rigging is following uh, in trying to create significant breakthrough uh, in our own safety culture. So this is a, a pretty good example of how that works. Um, Any time that uh, this work enters into an organization or an organization puts their hand in the air and says, this is what I want to do, uh, the work, those that are leading this work in injury free, they come with some basic assumptions to the company. Uh, those being the people in the organization, senior most leaders across the organization, they're committed to safety. Like there's, there's no question that they're committed to safety. The next is that they're doing everything that they know to do. Uh, they're not leaving anything on the table. They're not, you know, leaving any ideas uh, off the table uh, and holding back. So they're doing everything they absolutely know to do in service of uh, preventing people from getting hurt. And then the third assumption is that people are still getting hurt, and people are still getting hurt, and that's not acceptable. So that, that's kind of the entry point for most organizations when they take this work on. Uh, if I were to describe the work of incident injury free, it's a, it's a top-down commitment-based approach to safety. Uh, it cannot proceed through an organization until 
the senior most leaders in an organization stand and commit publicly, declare their commitment to the possibility of the total elimination of worker injury. And so once that commitment is made, then it allows other managers and leaders and employees in the company to stand inside of that commitment uh, and act based on that commitment. Um, we, we need them to bring their own commitment, but their commitment, absent of leadership's commitment, has that be a pretty weak position. So it starts at the top and can't proceed until the top's got it and is completely uh, committed to it. Um, so once that happens, the, the type of work that we're doing with our folks uh, and the conversations that we're having, and, and must understand that this is uh, very little event-based work, uh, very much uh, relationship-based work, uh, conversation-based work. And one of the things for uh, people to get into relationship with is to understand uh, if, we're, if we're interested in where we're going and committed to where we're going, we really need to understand where we've been. And if you look at the history of safety or even the evolution of safety, um, we take people through and, and have them acknowledge the different eras of safety that we've been through. Uh, and you can go back as far as you would like, but for the purpose of this call, maybe we talk about from the turn of the century to somewhere in the 40s or 50s is an era of safety that uh, we could refer to as an era of no formal interest. You know, not a lot of rigid guidelines and regulations and legislation that said you must do this or must not do that. Um, and at that time, you know, this is the, the, the big high-rise construction buildings when the expected fatality rate was killing one person per floor. It, it's back in those days. Um, and then there's a shift in that era of safety, so the, there's things that happen along the way. So, you know, uh, midway through the century, you've got the total, total quality movement that comes into play. That has a pretty drastic impact uh, on the way that we approach our work. Uh, therefore reducing the number of people that are getting hurt, so it makes a pretty good impact. And then you, you go farther into the future, or now our past, into around the 1970s, which is an interesting time because it's pretty consistent for a lot of our uh, the major countries that we do work in, whether it's in the, the UK, the United States, Canada, wherever. Uh, but that's the advent of OSHA uh, and the legislative bodies that you know, wrote the regulations, finally enough it happened to where they said we must put something in writing that says you must do this and you must not do that. Uh, and that would be an era that would be uh, referred to as a preventive era of safety. Uh, so what are the things that we do to, to, so that we get less of what we don't want? Um, and as, you know, since the 70s, as we've progressed into present day, uh, we've seen the rate in which people get hurt. Um, driven down to a point to where almost, I think it was, this would be pretty consistent for most organizations over the past 10, 15, 20 years, we've been in a relative flat line for the last 15, 20 years, maybe even more. Um, and, and so we, today we are spending more and more money uh, donating more and more time and resource um, in service of safety for less and less return. And so the, the gap between where we are in terms of uh, the rate in which people get hurt and where we want to be, which is the total elimination, um, I would assert, and Incident Injury Free would assert, that it's not because of lack of policies and procedures. Um, it's, it's because of people. It's because of how do we engage people um, in, in the right kind of way to have them own the responsibility or to accept that responsibility and to be held accountable for their actions uh, rather than expecting, Kevin, like you referenced earlier, that it's not the safety person's responsibility to keep you safe. So this approach is based on attacking that gap um, and it's very personal. So Vaughn said that you know it's about making safety personal um, and absolutely agree and I'd say also making safety important and making it relevant to folks. Um, and so in this, this era that I believe we're in now, we're shifting from this preventive era into what IIF would call a creative era of safety, whereby we're no longer just trying to prevent the things we don't want, we're actually trying to do the things to create the outcome we do want. So in essence, we're shifting away from less of what we don't want into we, this, we want more of what we do want. And so it's a different mindset to go through. And that that history of safety or the evolution, if you look at it as an evolutionary process, um, it, it's not that we stop preventing to just create because in an evolutionary process, 
each forward step is built upon and includes the previous step. So we'll always react, we'll always prevent, uh, but today we say that it's time for us to also create the outcome that we're looking for. Um, inside of that, it, it poses a lot of questions for us, and uh, we do a lot of work to teach our folks, particularly our leaders and managers uh, who are uh, the recipients of the challenges, uh, to be able to distinguish between the different types of challenges. And so uh, for this conversation, uh, there's a distinction between what we would refer to as a technical challenge, which would be the, we know what the question is, uh, and somewhere someone has an answer. It's a technical issue, whether it's in their head, through their experience, or it's in a manual, I can find it on the internet. It's a, it's a question that we've got an answer to. It's a technical challenge. Um, the next challenge would be uh, an adaptive challenge, and that being the type of challenge where we know what the question is, but we don't really know what the answer is. There's no readily available answer. And an example of that could be, how do you solve world hunger? Well, that's a great question, uh, one that we're still trying to figure out. And the, the reason why it's an important distinction for our leaders and managers is because here's how it's worked in the past, is we have always had adaptive challenges. Uh, we may not have had the, the language to name it appropriately, uh, we just didn't know how to deal with them. And the way that we did deal with them was we fell into this trap of trying to apply technical solutions to an adaptive challenge, which is nothing more than putting a Band-Aid on the problem, and then at some point in the future, that problem resurfaces and the same challenges keep coming back up to us. So it's this vicious cycle of we keep seeing the same problems come back to us over and over and over. And in the in the world of safety, it's why don't people take responsibility for their own safety? And there's a number of other conversations that could go with that. So getting our leaders and managers to understand that distinction, and not that we don't honor and work technical issues, but the leadership work um, really should be focused on the adaptive challenge. Management of the technical issues, yes. Leadership for creating the outcome is in an adaptive arena. So IIF is very much an adaptive challenge. And if you look at the question of how do we eliminate totally worker injury in the workplace? So how do we get rid of that? Well, that's a really good question. And we're trying to figure that out. And so the adaptive challenge requires a person or an organization to learn their way through to the answer. And so given an organization and the leaders the, the skills to have the right kind of conversations in the right kind of way, uh, in a way, Kevin, that I would I would describe as that kind of conversation requires uh, a group of people or even an individual to be much more interested in the question than we are in the answer, which is a real departure uh, from how we normally do business. Because we, we are problem solvers. Uh, we got into the positions we're in because we know some stuff. Uh, we know how to find the answers. We know how to solve the issues. Um, but in this, this adaptive world of total elimination of worker injury, um, it's, it's not technical. We have to step back and be very interested in the questions because the questions in themselves will lead us to, to more questions. And the more questions we're able to ask, the more we're able to learn and, and break into areas that we didn't see possible for ourselves. Um, and as we start to engage our workforce, um, just front and center for our folks, uh, and, and any folks I would say, you know, we're trying to present presence for them this contradiction in safety. That contradiction being that uh, nobody wants to get hurt. Nobody wakes up in the morning, rolls out of the bed, and said, today's my day. Uh, today's the day that I'm going to hurt myself um, or hurt someone else. Um, and so nobody says that. But in the same breath, they go and put themselves at risk. They do things that they probably shouldn't do or they know they shouldn't do because there's this mindset of it's not going to happen to me, that those kind of accidents and those kind of injuries and those kind of incidents occur to other people, but not me. I'm too smart, I'm too fast, I'm too strong, whatever the two piece is. Um, so we, we get people to understand the, you know, this, this whole idea of this contradiction to safety. Like there, there are walking contradictions in every organization. You know, the safety professional that stands in front of a group on his soapbox or her soapbox preaching about what people should do and then their, their behavior or their demonstration of their own commitment to safety is they jump into their vehicle to get off to the next meeting or the next site, and they've got a cell phone in their hand, and they're talking, or they're, you know, 
don't have a seatbelt on, they're speeding down the road, so that's a walking contradiction. Um, so all of this to be said is to try to get our folks to this point where they can recognize and admit that it can happen to me. And when we can get people to recognize that it not only it can happen to me, but if my relationship to safety is that of uh, it is someone else's responsibility to keep me safe, uh, that relationship will lead to it will happen to me. Not only it can happen, but it is going to happen to me. Um, in the work of IIF, uh, a, a principal conversation is this whole idea of relationship. And Kevin, you referenced this earlier. Um, IIF would say that uh, relationship is the foundation of all accomplishment. And when we talk to our employees about this, when we engage people in this conversation, uh, it's, it's an interesting model to put on a board. You can imagine how it's met by the workforce who's not really interested in looking at a flip chart or a whiteboard with some type of model on it. Um, but we're trying to get people to understand that, uh, that whatever we're able to accomplish has a direct relationship to how we relate to that. So whether it's an interpersonal relationship um, or how we relate to policies and procedures, uh, concepts and ideas, uh, that it's, it's paramount to our success and safety. So interpersonal is the first point of entry. It's easy for people to grasp. Uh, and so it's a, it's a key function of our work is trying to get it to know our people better. We think we know the people that we work with. We've worked with them for years. We sit in the office next to them or we work in the same crew with them. But really, how much do we know about the people that we work with? So this work of IIF um, causes people to be very interested in who other people are. And not only who other people are, but what's on their mind. What are the distractions or the baggage that they bring with them to the job site that could be distracting them away from their work on any given day at any given time? And uh, as it relates to, say, the policies and procedures, a very live and active conversation at TNT uh, that's getting some interesting feedback is challenging the workforce uh, around how do they relate to the safety processes that are made available to them to help them be successful in the work. So do they relate to a pre-task hazard assessment as a piece of paper they must fill out to keep from getting, getting hurt or getting, getting in trouble? Or do they have this relationship that says, if I do a really good job at this with my crew and we understand what our plan is for the day, the hazards associated, the plan to mitigate, who's responsible for those, then the, the chances of us getting hurt are greatly diminished. It's two completely different relationships to the same concept, one a very weak position, one a pretty powerful position. So how do they relate to it? So we're, we're ever challenging how individual leaders relate to their own leadership and safety, but also to our workforce and how they relate to the things that we give them as safety professionals. Uh, because normally they hear uh, or experience the things that come out of the safety departments as, oh no, this is another piece of paper we have to fill out. And so there's this immediate relationship to the processes that they're given. So we, we do a lot of work in that area. And with the idea that if we're able to expand our relationship or deepen or broaden or widen our relationship, then if we get the relationship base bigger, then we're able to accomplish more. It has a direct impact on what we're able to accomplish. And and in today's environment, the example that I would use here at TNT is we would say that we're, we would argue that we're as good or better than anybody in our industry at what we do, that our processes are top notch, our equipment is top shelf, um, nobody's better. And today's reality says people still get hurt here. And so if we want to build a reality uh, or a level of achievement where people don't get hurt, that requires us, if we want more achievement, we got to have more of that relationship. Um, so we're, we're trying to get our folks through to this, this point in time where they're actually able to acknowledge the possibility of the total elimination of worker injury. And it's, it's a pretty hard thing for people to grasp. Um, but, you know, if you, can, if you can do it for an hour, you know, you can do it for a shift, you can do it for a day, a week, a month, that kind of thing. Um, so we, we've got to hold it as a possibility. This is not a conversation about likelihood or probability. This is about it's possible. And we stand in this, this area of commitment or this stance of commitment pointing at this possibility that we could eliminate worker injury. It doesn't have to be a cost that we pay. It's a product of doing the work that we do. Um, and along the way, when they're able to see that possibility, 
there's a process that we go through where people are, the way I would describe it, people are invited to answer this question about themselves. Am I who I say I am? And for those people that see this possibility of working with hurting people, which is a departure from, well, what are you going to do? People are going to get hurt. You know, it's we work in a risky business. It's construction. It's crane work. It's whatever your business is. It's bound to happen. When we get them to acknowledge this is a possibility that people don't have to get hurt, then the next step is for them to be able to examine how would they need to be differently in order to produce what they now see as a possibility. And so it's making them go to work on themselves, and this would be true for every person in the organization, that if I see a different possibility for myself, most of our folks would recognize that who they have been in the past would be insufficient to produce the outcome they now see possible. In order to get to that possibility, they have to be differently. And one of the traps that we run is uh, we normally would try to say, what would we do different? So we would need to do something differently. And so that was really kind of our only point of entry is that we were really, what do we change? What do we write a new procedure? We do a new training package. We do, we do something different. And we're saying that it's, it's not just doing, that a big element of this work is very much centered on your being. So who am I being as a leader uh, in this company? Or who am I being as an employee that's committed to safety? Um, so big topic for us. Uh, and, and this work, IIF, um, you know, there's some things that it is it is not, and there's some things that it is. And uh, incident injury free is not uh, about statistics. Uh, it's not zero, um, because once it starts being about the numbers, then it stops being about the people. So much of what Vaughn was saying is that this is about people, uh, and so our focus is on the people. Uh, it's 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 not about uh, giving somebody a recipe of the things they need to do to create that success. It's not a guarantee. There's no prescription for it. You know, no magic bullet that, that you can take a hold of and make this happen for your organization. What it is about, it's about uh, caring for one another. It's about uh, care and concern and demonstrating that care and concern on a daily basis consistently. You know, it's about people speaking up at all parts of the organization, speaking up without fail. Um, and that if it doesn't look right, it doesn't smell right, then we're going to ask the question, even if it's going to result in an education for me, that I learned something and my concern was not valid. Uh, more times than not, the concern is valid. But it's about speaking up at all times. It's about being open when others come speak to me, rather than rushing to that, that defensive position where, what are you doing talking to me? It's being open to that, that people would, will come and talk to you and speak up because they have care and concern for you. Um, and to acknowledge that it takes some courage for people to come forward and speak to you, um, to, to honor that and to listen to what they have to say to you. Um, it's about having the very hard conversations that you need to have in any organization, but having them in a very right kind of way uh, that has people experience um, <laughs> that negative conversation or the conversation that points out your shortfalls uh, in a way that builds you up, that edifies people. Um, and so it's about accountability. It's, it's really the heart and soul of incident injury for you. So with, with that as a bit of a framework, I'll quickly talk, Kevin, if I've got time, about the, this project in the Middle East. Do I have a few minutes? Yes. Yeah, we have another five minutes. OK. I'm sorry about that. I'm, <laughs> I'm got excited. Right. Yeah, so the, pro the project in reference, I'll, I'll speak briefly about this project that Shell uh, executed in the Middle East. Um, it was called the Shell Pearl Project. Um, this, this place was going to be really in the middle of the desert with no infrastructure, uh, no surrounding town. It was really going to be in the middle of nowhere. And all of the infrastructure and support system was going to have to be built around this site. Uh, at its peak workforce, it employed 52,000 construction labor employees. So wrap your head around that, 52,000 people. Those people spoke over 30 different languages, and they were from over 50 different countries. And so working in the Middle East, and this was a multi-year project, there's some, uh, there's some predictable concerns that a project like this would have. You know, as a safety professional, it's like, OK, how are we going to protect people from the heat? And there are no trees. And how are you going to get shade and get people uh, hydrated? All of those things. So uh, the work of IIF, the, the project leadership team, inclusive of all the principals and movers and shakers of the subcontractors that served that project, 
were heavily engaged in the leadership work of IAF before the project hit the field. And so they were making decisions about how they were going to how they were going to care for people before they ever got on site. And so that led to them uh, understanding that we need to be very interested in uh, our people understanding how we care about them. So first of all, we've got to tell them that we care about them. And in 30 different languages, that takes a little bit of time to do. Um, not only do we have to tell them, but we really have to mean that. Like it's one thing to say it, but it's another thing to hold that in my heart. And then lastly, we have to demonstrate that care on a daily basis. We have to prove that to them every day that we care about them. And that's, that's in the way of you know, how are their accommodations laid out, um, where do they get to their time for rest, uh, they're, because they're on the site, they're not leaving, they're there long term, um, they're separated from their family, so how do, we, how do we have them have home in a work environment when they're not on shift? And so all of that was done in the recreational facilities that were put together, uh, and I'll, I'll say all of that, there was a tremendous amount of work done, and the product that they that they pushed or the achievement uh, that was produced there was far beyond anything Shell could have ever predicted. It, it became the most successful project that Shell has ever executed and some would say it's the most successful project in world history. So in those 52,000 people uh, working in the peak, at the peak work time, they worked uh, 72 million hours without a lost time accident. 72 million hours without a lost time accident. And when the, they, were, they weren't even close, maybe they were 20% to go on the project, and they had an accident that occurred, and this speaks to the integrity of the leadership team, this was a sub, sub, subcontractor driving a vehicle uh, 15 miles away from the site, but was on duty and was en route to delivering something to the job site, but he was not on the physical site of the construction project. And there are folks who would, easily make arguments that that didn't happen inside our fence and he doesn't work for my company and therefore we, we wouldn't recognize that as an accident associated with our project. But the, the, the leaders, they, they had a lot of conversation. They said, you know, we, we are responsible for that person. And so the one lost time accident that they had actually didn't occur on their job site. It happened somewhere else. And then they went on to, uh, as the project closed up, they, they worked 84 million hours with one lost time accident, and the people that left that project, uh, it was it was probably the best experience they had in their life. Not only the construction management teams and the subcontractors, but the employees themselves who would have come from places all over the world, uh, because that leadership team brought them and, and created this this place where they probably felt care and concern uh, at a level that they'd never experienced before. Some of them and maybe, maybe in a way that they've never even experienced it from their own families. So, you know, what's possible when the organization really gets committed to it and this, this possibility of people not getting hurt, uh, if we can get the way that we're being uh, in an authentic way, uh, and that we're doing the things that we know to do, that we're a learning organization, uh, anything is possible. And what we're interested in at TNT is the total elimination of worker injury. Got a long way to go with that. Um, but what's fun is to see that leadership for safety starts to rise up out of all parts of the organization, and we have people that are leading and owning safety and driving safety from places and positions in the company that never would have dreamed of doing it. Um, and now that they see this possibility, they can't help themselves. They keep beating my door down and say, can I go do an audit in the field? And it's like, really? You know, you're a branch manager. You want to go do an audit? Okay, let's go do that. So. Uh, it's it's a lot to try to describe in a few minutes, Kevin. Um, I'd love to answer any questions or uh, push people into the right situation or the right place to learn more about this if they're interested. That's great. Thank you very much, Troy. Your, your discussion points about entering the creative era and respecting the previous technical, I would call regulatory requirements, uh, while establishing creative solutions to constantly asking questions to adapt. Um, my question to you on this, and then I've got to close it up, and then those, the questions will come from the field. But those that really resonates with me and, and connects, in my opinion, to the ideology of building an effective safety culture, thinking differently, acting differently, all those elements you, you mentioned. It, is that true to form? Is that what you were getting at? That 
it goes way beyond as Juan said the words. Um, is that where you were going with that creative era and, and all the examples you just gave us? A absolutely. It's doing the work, Kevin, to not only just have this this compliance-minded uh, approach to safety, because we used to say if we could just get people to do the right thing, if we could just get them to follow the rules. Well, you know what? 98% of the time, if, if you've got a behavior-based safety um, program, you probably would have statistics that show that 98% of the time um, your people do the right thing, but people still get hurt. And so it's a shift in the mindset that we intentionally have to do the things and, and have the right conversations and involve the right people to create the outcome that we're looking for. So my answer to you is yes and yes. That's great. Well, thanks. Thanks again for both you and Vaughn and uh, both of your real life in the trenches experiences uh, and perspectives on building effective safety cultures are very much appreciated and and I hope we get some good questions or feedback from the audience. Uh, let's let's wrap this up. We're, we're running right to our uh, allotted hour. Um, it, closing final thoughts. I, I've seen far too many bureaucratic safety cultures that try to enforce malicious obedience and that ends their culture. Um, and all they are doing is, my opinion, is attempting to compensate for their own um, incompetence and, and discipline to, to reach people's hearts and minds. Uh, as both have said, and, and as certainly as Troy has indicated um, in that historical perspective, the, the result has been um, injury rates are still there and occasional catastrophic events still happen. So as you've heard throughout today's presentation, the more effective approach to building a proper safety culture would be to establish a working foundation of personal care and constant communication. Sounds pretty basic, um, but uh, you heard you know, real live examples of two experts that that's the approach they've taken um, and that seems to be having some momentum where we're hoping uh, our industry as a whole buys into it. Um, I hope you believe, as, as I do, and I know Vaughn and, and um, Troy does, transformation is possible. And, and everyone can achieve effective uh, safety culture trans transformation and, and uh, protecting their workforce to try to, uh, to get to that point that Troy repeatedly uh, mentioned about elimination of, of worker injuries and, and incidents. Um, so, and the positive outcome that I've learned from both of these experts and, and some, some other research is that uh, a positive outcome of this type of achievement in safety culture actually creates a contagiousness, a contagious nature for your people uh, that you will gain and the outcome being they all go home and it gets better as you go. So we want to thank you all for participating, and now let's hear your feedback or any questions. Katie, we'll turn it over to you. Great. Okay. Um, we're here. We do have a couple of questions here, and a lot of it goes back to what you're talking about, Kevin, as far as regulation is not the basis for your training. And this was just a comment for someone from someone was that if, um, if his people are meeting the 29 CFR standards, their letter grade is a C. Um, and ask them, what can you do to get an A in any certain standard? And I think that that's kind of important is, you know, this is just the baseline for you. What can you go beyond, or what can you do to go beyond that? Um, a, a particular question that was associated with that comment was, do you feel that too much enforcement is detrimental to a safe culture? And that could go to anybody. Yeah, that, I, I would encourage both the experts to respond. My, my opinion is, um, Enforcement's a heavy word, and if it's uh, a discipline uh, for what the rules are, and the rules are pers personal care based, uh, then enforcement is required. But maybe Vaughn or and Troy have some input on that. Yeah, Kevin, well, I I really believe that that it's important. I think that it's critical, but I think first you gotta give them the why, and they need to understand what's ex what's expected of them. Um, orientations are good. Orientations scratch the surface in terms of what's expected of a construction worker. I think all of our efforts need to be around 
educating and, and involving and including and getting feedback and, and building um, a, a strong system. Um, when we're comfortable that our team knows what, what's expected of them, they understand what success looks like, we've, we've uh, laid out a clear path to success, and if choices are made to go outside of that, I think that accountability needs to be a key part of it. If you don't do it um, fairly and consistently, all the people that are working to your end are going to notice, right? And you're, you're standing up. You have to be, always be very mindful of the messages that you send when you choose to uh, discipline um, or not to not to enforce. You know, so I would just it's uh, you know investigate, get all the facts, and but be very very comfortable that the individual knew and understood what was expected of them. And uh, if they went outside that, hold them accountable. The crew's expecting you to do that as a leader. What do you put? Kevin, can you hear me? What are the? Go ahead. Yep. I, I was going to say um, what I would add to that is uh, I, I think what would be unacceptable is a, a, an organization or a culture uh, that does not hold people accountable for their actions. In this case, making sure people did what they were supposed to do. What comes into question for me is, one, when we have those conversations with people that address the things that they're doing that they should not be doing, uh, we need to be, we as managers need to be very consistent in how we deal with those things. One of the things that sends a very bad message to our workforce is when one person, when two people do the same thing, but one person is dealt with one way and another person is dealt with a different way. Uh, that, that creates a lot of frustration and confusion. The other thing I'd say that, um, that, that tends to promote this is, if you remember when I said that behavior-based safety processes, we, when we measure the, the rate in which of how often we work safe, you know, whether we put percentages to that, but you know, in that 95 to 98 percent of the time we work safely, like we, it's a rare occasion when people are working, you know, 100 percent unsafe. It, it's really various degrees of less safe or more safe. So if you think about the little things that need to be addressed, here's where uh, management and supervisors um, tend to create, with the best intentions, they tend to create the wrong actions in people. When people engage, when our managers engage with people who are working in a way that they shouldn't be working, we tend to reserve all of our communication for the few things that are not going well, and we don't take the time to acknowledge the things that are going right. So there's no justice and feedback. And so this concept of having justice and feedback of, yes, these things need to be addressed, yes, you need to follow those procedures, but we also acknowledge all of the things that you are doing right. And so it, it's a different way of talking to people. You're having the same conversation, and you're engaging them in a much different kind of way. Good input. Uh, what, any other? Uh, I don't think anyone mentioned anything about technology or processes. Um, what sort of processes or software platforms are in place at um, either organization to communicate and discuss the safety culture with the teams in the field. I'm going to leave that up to the experts. I'm a dinosaur with technology. <laughs> well, you've well, got so to we're doing a couple of things, and it's really – go ahead. No, go, go on, Bond. You're doing great. But we're, do, we're actually doing a couple of things, and, um, you know, technology is, is – uh, I mean, it's a huge – huge benefit to us in terms of getting real-time data out to the crew. The, some of the older systems we had, um, you know, the, the intervention observation information, for example, was three weeks old. Um, and in construction, we, I mean, everybody understands it's a fairly dynamic environment, so things are changing. And what is what are coming out on the reports, that work may have been completed, that crew may have gone out. So there was a lot of stale information getting out to the crew uh, that may or may not have meant anything to them. So we've, we've got scannable intervention cards, and we're able to get data out in, in, um, in poster format. We've got action logs that are, that are uh, generated by it, and it's real-time data. So we can show the leadership and the crew what was, uh, what was going on yesterday. And um, we're able to, to focus the crews, the people that have intervened and reported on the system, to say, look, okay, what are we going to do about this? Our trend is walkways. Our trend is this. Our trend is rigging. Um, or, you know, 
whatever the issue is, get the team focused on it real time and get them engaged in fixing the problem. Um, the, inter the observation card also has an opportunity for them to submit any think different, build better um, suggestions, how we can improve everything from how we store our material, how we you know lay down areas, how we prep lay down areas, how we're um, you know, mobilizing equipment onto site, or any number of things. Uh, really, the work process, how do we improve it? So I guess the, the thing about technology is that it's allowed us to, to provide real-time reporting back to the crew and show them uh, a scorecard and shows us uh, where we're winning and where we need work. Troy, did you have anything to add? No, I would just say I would I would love to uh, spend some time with Vaughn so I could learn some of that from her. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm familiar with the process. Uh, we're I'm really new to TNT, so a lot of this is in development now. But you know, we we're interested in the use of social media to open up a, a method of communication to leadership. The danger in that is how do you control that and how do you temper that and how do you respond to it? So it, it's how people misuse those type of processes that tend to have them die on the vine. Um, at this point, uh, technology is something that is in creation for our company. The big focus now is that personal uh, interaction with people, making sure that the doors are open and, and available for people to come in. Uh, I'd love to spend some time with Vaughn, though. OK. Um. Let me see if there's any other additional questions. I mean, are, are we seeing management buying into safety uh, cultures more these days? I think that's kind of always been the the comment that we hear out here is that you know managers need to buy into it. Are we seeing that more? I can tell you, we have we see crane and steel erection and heavy iron operators daily. Um, we are seeing more of it, and it's permeating lower on the size scale. Certainly the larger ones uh, do it, and if we wish we could get some version of this McGraw-Hill report out for that, because it's all uh, survey-based, and it seems crystal clear that the general contractors are, uh, are doing it, and they are expecting the subcontractors to do it, and they would enhance it. Um, our trades the ability to get more work if if they can prove that, that they've got a cultural advantage or a cultural difference. Um, so I think it's a movement similar to what um, Troy mentioned about the eras changing, um, and we're we're hoping to help facilitate that that move from what we do. My view is yes. I don't have a Great. I don't have a sense of how. Um, how that's increasing across the country and across industries. Uh, what I would say is transformation in the safety culture will not happen unless senior leaders are engaged and committed. So as, if they're not engaged committed, that transformation uh, will not happen. Something may occur that makes you think it's transformation, but it won't be sustainable. Great. I think those are all the questions that we had for today. Um, I will be sending out a follow-up email with a link to the recorded webinar uh, for all of the attendees and registrants for this event. Um, if you all don't have any further comments or questions, um, thank you all for attending today. Thank you, Troy, Vaughn, and Kevin, as always, for your expertise. And have a great afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Take care, everyone.